Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan with another uh, episode of the Influence Continuum. And I have a fascinating interview today on, to just jump to it, Psychedelic Fascism with Nishé Davino. Nishé, I listened to your interview with a colleague and friend, Dave Troy, on his podcast, Dave Troy Presents, and I was like, whoa, this is really, 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 really important. And uh, my listeners know that I've interviewed Rachel Harris on psychedelics in the past, Peter, Dr. Peter Grinspoon about cannabis. I have a deep interest in uh, all issues of healing and helping people recover, as well as a deep interest in um, undue influence and how uh, people can be harmed uh, by by uh, use of ayahuasca and and mushrooms and other things and indoctrinated in that tender uh, state. So for my listeners, I want to just give an uh, intro to you to start our discussion. Nishé Devenot is a PhD senior lecturer in writing at John Hopkins University, and you've contributed in the interdisciplinary field of psychedelic studies since 2010. You completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Bioethics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, received your PhD in comparative literature at the University of Pennsylvania. Your scholarship explores the intersections between medical humanities, psychedelic bioethics, and rhetorical analysis. You're the 2015 Research Fellow at the New York Public Library's Timothy Leary Papers and a Research Fellow with the New York University Psilocybin Cancer Anxiety Study, where she participated in the first qualitative study of participant experiences. And Nishé, uh, you wrote a, a really important journal article that I've read several times now. It's called Tiscreal hallucinations, psychedelics, and AI hype as inequality engines. So all I can say is I'm very grateful to you for this research, for your thinking, your critical thinking. And um, you were positive on psychedelics. You weren't, you didn't start as a critic. So can we start there and then we can <laughs> go into why why this topic is so vital for the planet to know about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the reason I bothered getting into a field that was extremely taboo back when I started in 2010 was because I had experienced firsthand benefits. So I grew up with quite debilitating obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety, um, found out later it was kind of both connected to neurodivergence, but I grew up not having resources that could have helped me. And then suddenly, unexpectedly, without knowing that there was a therapeutic rationale, mm -hmm. I was introduced to LSD in my case in college uh, when I was 18. So half a, <laughs> half a lifetime ago now. Um, and it really changed everything for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I had the feeling then that the most profound experience of my life was an experience I wasn't supposed to have. And that seemed very odd to me. So I went in that in that direction. And it's only really later that I started to see that not all was light and rainbows in this in this area. And so I've really been, um, you know, pushing for a more nuanced and critical perspective in this in this area. That's fantastic. And um, the abstract to your journal article starts with just saying, you know, there's a history of medicalization and pills for dealing with psychological issues, SSRIs, but even earlier than that. And it seems like the laissez-faire libertarian, you know, capitalism move, has now moved heavily into psychedelics. Let's give everybody psychedelics. However, the billionaires in Silicon Valley involved with AI are also taking them a lot. And of course, they have this ideology apparently about transhumanism and long-termism. 
I'm going to ask you to, to, to unpack uh, more about your research and your concerns. Yeah, well, so I started noticing parallels between the psychedelic hype, medicalization hype that I was noticing in my field, and then just reading about the AI hype, uh, which really kicked off in the last year with chat GPT and, and, yeah. and all those new uh, public facing technologies, right. um, generative, generative images and that, that sort of thing. And I, I was seeing that there were a lot of parallels in the ways that some of these Silicon Valley boosters were presenting AI in that case, or, you know, parallel to psychedelics as something that was just going to fix literally every problem known to mankind, <laughs> ranging from <laughs> climate change to the rise of fascism to political polarization to, uh, you know, depression, <laughs> you name it. Right. And just from my own, my own academic background, I've been very aware of the fact that each of those are influenced by growing inequality in society. So it seemed very striking to me that there were these very well off billionaires that were essentially distracting from that underlying cause and trying to present their new technology as the thing that's going to fix all the world's problems and conveniently make them a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So that was my initial reason for looking at the parallels. But then at, the more I read into these kind of fantasy perspectives of the Silicon Valley tech elite, the more I started seeing that these ideas about, you know, transhumanism, long-termism, as you mentioned, and I'll, I'll stop for a second just to briefly describe those. So transhumanism, <laughs> transhumanism uh, essentially is the idea that we can cultivate evolution intentionally to transcend to a, a, a new form of consciousness beyond what we what, what we see as humankind today and that we can do that through a combination of you know technologies psychedelics some some cases people say meditation you know that, that this is something that can, that can be actively cultivated um and isn't then, it also like we can have android bodies and put our consciousness into computer chips yeah, or something ab absolutely and that that's actually where it gets dangerous is when you are focusing on you know we don't, we can leave the material world behind we can kind of use the earth as a source of fuel that we can just burn up in order to get our computers and digitized consciousness off planet and it's dangerous when it's combined with this long-termism idea uh, that has, you know, a, a lot of philosophers who have been, you know, he heavily paid by some of the billionaires who benefit from these ideas. Right. They have suggested that, you know, because there's a potential for so many more people to exist in the far distant future, we're actually, we owe more morally to those future beings than we do to the people who are alive in the world today. And with the idea that we can digitize consciousness and spread and colonize that digitized consciousness to the stars through supercomputers, there's potentially many, many orders of more beings <laughs> in that future world. And so it just all of that has been used to justify putting people in difficult situations in the world today, contributing to climate change, burning everything up because we're confident that we're moving towards this future end goal. Um, and, and and just the last thing I'll say about that is, I I was following uh, so that, that the concept of the test reel, which links transhumanism to the effect of altruism movement and then long termism, was developed by uh, Timnit Jebru and Emil Torres in mm. the AI side of things. And as I was reading their ideas, it struck me that I didn't think that some of the people in the AI side were really cognizant of the very serious possibility that widespread psychedelic use among Silicon Valley is likely contributing to these convictions about a far distant future and eating in the grandiose kind of sense that these billionaires have the right to take the reins and move the future in a direction that's not ultimately good for the people who are alive today. Yep. And if I may say, Dave Troy interviewed the two researchers that you just cited, mm -hmm. another excellent podcast to listen to. But I, I need to say this, and that is I wrote this book called The Cult of Trump, 
I researched it heavily, and it just seems to me like Putin and the Russians uh, want want to influence uh, Americans, business people, etc., to um, accomplish. Because, you know, Putin has a lot of oil and fossil fuel and the Coke industries, I'm naming some names, uh, the Middle Eastern oil barons. They want to keep promulgating and distracting from the fact that we're destroying our environment. And so this is a version of uh, going to heaven, except you're mm-hmm. going to outer space heaven versus like being a Christian or religious person going to some metaphysical heaven but the 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 what i'm trying to get at is that a, a billionaire is a human being too and get them on mushrooms or lsd and you can hypnotize them to believe all kinds of bad stuff is where i'm coming from and i don't know that the billionaires even have a awareness because they're so egocentric that they can be manipulated by bad actors for other agendas too. So I just wanted to add that piece to this conversation. Yeah, I mean, there's so there's so much concerning here in this general area in terms of you know the the ability to spread this idea and to get people to buy in and step in line with this kind of vision of a future Mm -hmm. um, that we're moving towards. And and there was actually just recently, a few weeks ago, I think, in the Wall Street Journal, um, another article about drug use among Silicon Valley CEOs. So there was one last summer where they were mentioning that billionaires are, you know, taking psychedelics together and doing business deals. Um, But more recently, there was an article focusing in on Elon Musk and interviewing people in his orbit who were saying that a you know, the increasing um, uh, disintegration of his kind of stability and and, and his, his odd behavior, you can say, in recent yeah. years has been associated with people in his orbit with his increasing uses of of, of, of drugs like ketamine and, and potentially other psychedelics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good point. So, and... Um... There's so many directions I want to go on on this, but I want to say that I am 100% for uh, clinical research that's responsibly done. There is evidence that MDMA, uh, 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 psilocybin with a therapist under proper conditions with traditional therapy already been engaged in and explored, et cetera, to help uh, get people out of it, it. I heard it described as canalization, like a, the, mm-hmm. a, a, our brain neuronal things are like canals. We can get stuck. And using psychedelics, using these types of um, treatments in a therapeutic context with mental health professionals uh, can actually do miraculous uh, shifts for people. But what we're seeing here is just people partying it seems to me, or just a, a lot of self-experimentation. Uh, and it's it, the danger is so extreme because people are online eight hours a day and there's all this horrible content, a lot of it disinformation, a lot of it to, deliberately to uh, bring up negative arousal states, uh, fear states, anger states, disgust states which take us away from our critical frontal cortex (laughs) thinking abilities of what is common sense and what is good for me. Yeah. I mean, part, part of the issue in raising some of these concerns with psychedelics and part of the reason why I make a point to emphasize that I have personally benefited therapeutically from psychedelics is that there have been there's been such a resistance to talking about a more nuanced approach and the risks and the harms, uh, especially in the past few years, back to when I began working in the field, that started to shift a bit this past, you know, half a year uh, after there was an Alaska Airlines pilot that National News pointed out. We, you know, he tried to down a plane 
um, after he had a difficult psilocybin experience. And then more recently, Matthew Perry uh, died after taking ketamine, which is different from the classic psychedelics, but also associated um, with the kind of psychedelic assisted therapy world. Mm -hmm. So now more people are saying we need to, you know, consider what are the risks and not just emphasize the positives. But for the past years, there was a fear uh, by many among p many people working in the field that people had worked so hard to get this back into legitimate institutional research and right. academic conversation that you know any mention of the bad potentials could undo undo that. But I and others from you know quite early on have been pointing out that you know if the people who are raising the downsides are anti psychedelic that's not going to bode well for the future of the field. Uh, right. And I think it's actually much better if those of us who do think that there's value and potential in these substances are the ones to mention that it's not always a, a positive outcome. Yeah, exactly. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just say, you know, I have the bite model of authoritarian control. And one of the features and the thought control is a simplistic black and white, us versus them, good versus evil frame of it's either all or nothing, or it's all good or it's all bad. And the world is much more complex than that. <laughs> and, and, and I want to state categorically, anything that has the power to heal has the power to hurt mm. if, it's, if it's misused. Fire is great to heat food and keep you warm, and it can burn down a wonderful city like it did in Lahaina. Um, so that we need to have more nuance. We need to have scholarship and, and, and clinical studies. And we want to also, I believe, warn the public that, yeah, things are stressful. People are feeling very unsafe and, and, and the future's bad. There's this easy temptation to tune out and that somehow everything will be okay. But we need to, we're grounded in our bodies and we need to take care also of basic common sense and, and sleep properly and eat properly, but also have an awareness about undue influence. And with that, I'd like to mention, if, if I may, Nishé, an article that just came to my attention <clears throat> it actually came out in 2022, but um, it, the title is A Psychedelic Therapist Allegedly Took Millions from a Holocaust Survivor, Highlighting Worries About Elders Taking Hallucinogens. Or, uh, hallucinogens. Um, and it talks about a Holocaust survivor named George Sarlo and a uh, Vicky Dulai of MAPS who was um, like trip-sitting him and he wound up uh, giving her a Porsche and buying, you know, giving her millions of dollars. And, uh, you know, anyone that knows the Shefflin social influence model that's in my doctoral dissertation looks at influency and their vulnerabilities, influencer, and uh, who, what, when, where, how, and the consequences. And in no shape, uh, should a therapist or a coach be getting millions of dollars from a person for spending a few hours uh, during a psychedelic trip? Right, and that I mean that that article, excellent article by Olivia Goldhill, uh, emphasizes that it's much more than that too. I mean, there's it's not just payment. It was like double, triple relationships, romantic relationships um, that were alleged to be involved here, and that. That is actually quite common for aspects of the guiding, psychedelic guiding community in the underground. And this actually it relates to something that well, you mentioned that, you know, the, the therapeutic guided approach is, you know, thought to be safer than just taking psychedelics recreationally. And I, I just want to emphasize that that is still a hypothesis that's being tested. And there certainly are some risks that... Uh, can be caught and managed if you have a professional that's overseeing mental you health and, professional, yeah, mental health professionals yeah. specifically. But I, I, I do also want to caution in case there's any 
any listeners that are kind of compelled by having heard that people who aren't benefited from other things are benefited here. Because part of the problem at the moment is that there's not, a, there's growing research that's going on in clinical trials, but it's still very small, the number of, of spots for, for participants relative to the amount of people who are interested in seeking out psychedelic therapy. Um, and so people are right now quite desperate. I mean, the world is on fire in a number of ways, as we were mentioning right. before. And people are, I'm, I'm, we're hearing accounts of people who are, you know, mortgaging their house, traveling overseas, desperate to find guided therapeutic support. Mm -hmm. um, people are going to the underground, you know, some of whom are people who who do have training and 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 some with licenses and therapy. Um, but there's a lot to be cautious about in these contexts right. because there, I worked, I collaborated on a paper, for example that emphasize that we don't actually know there could be some there could be harms in doing therapy with psychedelics um, right. that we haven't really investigated the the power differential especially a lot of these trials have two co-therapist team often a one man and one woman um but that that varies uh who are in a position of power but because of that because there's there's two of them and only one of you there are accounts of people feeling ganged up on yep. experiencing ideological harm because they're expressing something they're trying to share something and then two people who are trained in the same way are saying that some a different way of looking at the situation is the case and in mm. some cases that can be very difficult um but in general people there 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 well so i should i should mention too there has been a, a few cases of ab abuse happening in yep. above board clinical trials Mm -hmm. Um, and in at least one of those cases, it was tied directly to ideas, uh, theories of healing, ideologies of healing that have emerged and been developed in the underground. So mm -hmm. there, 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 there's just a lot to be, I just, I just want to emphasize that there's a lot to still be watchful about, even in cases where there is a guide present. Yeah. And I, I'll just say, um, one thing that would change things quickly is demand for videotaping the sessions and giving a copy to the, the the person who's the subject and not just the people who are doing it, because then critiques can be done by experts uh, and and training can be developed on what, what to do and what not to do. Um, and further, I just want to put it out there that I, I've been exposed to clinical hypnotherapy as an incredibly powerful methodology for dealing with trauma and empowering people. Um, of course, it, it too has a high potential for abuse and, and uh, by, by mental health trained, licensed mental health professionals also. But man, if it's recorded, um, uh, it's going to prevent a lot of bad actors. Uh, and if anyone's refusing to allow a recording, it's going to weed out really quickly. But what I'm trying to say is for those people who are desperate because they're so much in distress and pain and, and they're not getting relief, there are alternatives to psychedelics that can produce some very powerful effects in a good way that are empowering and ethical. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's just, there's a lot, there's a lot of uncertainty about, you know, who psychedelics are helpful for under what conditions and mm -hmm. how lasting are the outcomes. Cause some of the people who have expressed harm, experiencing harm, even in clinical trials initially described benefit. And yeah. that was, that was what was recorded in the published data. But in some cases, they were in such a kind of afterglow of, from the experience and and felt so close to their therapist that that was kind of what they they weren't looking at the fact that they're actually they 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 weren't cured miraculously in the way that maybe initially they had they had thought. Um, and so that that kind of the suggestibility of psychedelics and yes. that the healing context can seem more salient or more impressive uh in the immediate after effect and that's and people aren't necessarily all benefiting 
from Great. these experiences. Great point. And so it's not just the short-term effects, it's what, you know, is there lasting benefit as a result of this? And as you were talking, Nishe, I w- couldn't help but make a connection for me. When people get first recruited by mind control cults, it, we call it the honeymoon phase because they're in love and this mm. is the greatest thing that's ever happened to them until like reality comes back in and now they've lost their freedom and their 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 center of gravity inside themselves because they're looking outside to the therapist or the 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 guide uh instead of you know what's best for them and listening to their family and friends who know them and care about them Absolutely. And, you know, people have described psychedelics, which have had many names in the past, but one of the names has been cultogenic in the sense that psychedelics have consistently, not always, but throughout time been used in the um, generation and propagation of cult groups. Um, This is a, a controversial topic to talk about because a lot of uh, psychedelic churches, for example, ayahuasca churches in Europe, ayahuasca being a, a tea made out of multiple plants from the indigenous. Amazon region, the indigenous, mm-hmm. indigenous uh, medicine. A lot of groups have said, you know, we're being framed as cults so as not to have our religious freedoms respected. Mm-hmm. The problem is, from my research and talking to people and reading in this field, is that there are ongoing cult groups in the psychedelic underground that really emphasize these um, dis- the dissolution of boundaries, multiple relationships um, of healing where group where p- individuals are kind of conscripted into these communities. And right now there is no immune response to that in the above board psychedelic therapy world. One example of of what I'm referring to is evident in the fact that there's a bunch of, there's a few groups that are trying to be um, the kind of professional organizations Mm -hmm. for licensed psychedelic guides, therapists, nurses. And in some of the public representations of how these organizations are growing, Mm -hmm. there has been an uncritical emphasis on the need to respect the experiences of guides who have been guiding for decades in the underground Mm -hmm. in the sense that people are saying, you know, they have the expertise. They, they are the ones who know who this works for and how to work with people in these settings, but there's no, there's no vetting of that. And so they're creating, they're building loopholes into the overground Mm -hmm. of above board psychedelic guiding for these cults that we know exist to appear say say they're the ones with the with the expertise and there's no from my experience of talking to people in the field there's no fluency in ideas like the the bite model what to look out for um and there's a a really impressive paper that i just encountered recently but maybe you know it um i think from the 90s on psychotherapy cults and this paper um i think out of lewis and clark college had emphasize that a lot of medical ethics is focused on developing consensus rules and norms for like, you know, when to or not touch your client and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that is where psychedelic bioethics is today. There is this focus on, and it's it's also, you know, ethicists are coming into this field, which is newly big, newly a hot topic without an an exposure to the wider psychedelic ecosystem. And in many cases, they don't know what they don't know. And they haven't been trained in thinking about undue influence and from the kind of cult perspective. And so there's a a big oversight, I would say, in trying to focus on rules at the expense of attention to social dynamics that are leading to systematic violation of boundaries, as was described in that psychotherapy cult's paper. Yeah, was that Temerlin's paper by any chance? I, I forget the name of, off the, off came, the top of my head. came to my mind, but there, there have been some very important things. I do want to state categorically, I've had victims of ayahuasca cults uh, come to me for help. 
Uh, and I've also heard uh, of more than a few women who've been raped uh, by shamans at ayahuasca ceremonies. And you were talking academically about violation of boundaries, but I just wanted to name it that it's rape. Uh, when somebody is tripping their, their mind off and someone is the shaman who knows everything, uh, who's going to take care of them, and they say, well, you need to have a, a, a positive sexual relationship, so I'm going to heal you. Um, and, and just people are devastated uh, from this experience. Sometimes they get trapped for years before they get out of the cult. But um, again, it's a matter of I want you know, to state for my listeners, I want to empower people to think for themselves, make good sound decisions for themselves, know that we're embodied minds. So what we put in our body is really important and affects our minds. And we need to be able to uh, rely on family, friends, and bioethicists who have been trained and know as much as possible in this field you can always get a second opinion. You know, you don't, you're not alone. And you can say, hmm, let's look at the bite model. Let's look at malignant narcissists and look at the leader of this group that's administering these, these uh, psychedelic substances. And um, I, I can't help but also say that I grew up reading Carlo Castaneda and uh, it was a fraud. It was a cult. It was a fraud. I've talked to former victims of, of the Castaneda cult, but a lot of us uh, old fogies are walking around thinking that he really was with a magical mystery, you know, uh, brujo, you know, shaman guy. And it was just not true. Yeah. And th there's a whole history of tales of power that have been used to authorize behavior by, you know, supposed shamans, healers. Oftentimes people will say, you know, they trained with a shaman in the deepest, darkest part of the jungle. And that's, that's used to get people, convince people to buy into their special healing powers. But there is widespread exploitation of that, uh, you know, it, especially yeah. in the world today, now that this is a booming field and there aren't a lot of above board places to go to to get this sort of work uh, a guiding work yep. um and uh, in some cases there's no credible as you were saying with Castaneda, there's no credible indigenous lineage at all and people are just making up stories and then abusing participants mm -hmm. and this is when i mentioned that there's no immune system for these kinds of issues one of the places where that's very obvious is there's a lot of a lot of people are saying, you know, like I was saying with the the underground guides needing to be deferred to as as experts. There's also an emphasis on like the Rick Doblin, who has long led one of the biggest psychedelic organizations, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, has really been pushing for fewer and fewer amounts of required training for guides. Um, you know, a, a space for people without licensure. Um, but part of the problem with that is that you are creating a through line, a, a, an opening for people to come in who are driven to exert power and control over others. There's a lot of research, as I'm sure you've seen, um, with uh, you know cases like the Catholic Church or the Boy Scouts or the U.S. Olympics team, where people who are driven to exert power and control will often create life circumstances and career paths for themselves that provide them an access sure. to people to exert power over. And that is happening in the psychedelics field. And the easier we make it for people to, for kind of charismatic, grandiose figures to show up and claim special healing abilities, we're providing people to these figures on a silver platter. And yep. there just is not enough discussion about this in the field and just to get back to that um, that videotaped clinical trial abuse that I, I mentioned earlier, because sure. in that case, th there was a video, um, the the Power Trip cover story podcast went over this, the details of this, but um, they 
the the guides who were in, in, in who were the, the source of the abuse in that trial did come from ideologies from the underground and lineages from the underground ide- ideologies of healing confronting people with their trauma reenacting trauma abusing people ultimately um mm-hmm. and the, one of the concerning things to me in terms of my confidence in the field and being able to manage these issues is that there was very little engagement with the connection between the actions in the clinical trial that appeared on the tape and the lineages and ideologies of healing that are associated with groups with cultic sorts of practices. Sure. And that unwillingness to really introspect and look at the possibility that this wasn't just a statistical inevitability abuse happens everywhere, you can't control from human nature, and rather look at what are the underlying assumptions about this therapy and how it works, that that to me makes me, gives me pause and makes me, you know, just want to alert people that this field is not ideologically safe at the moment because there isn't, hasn't been that reckoning with how the ideas about healing are leading to harms. Yeah, incredibly important point. I guess I I have to uh, say um, uh, Hubbard, who created Scientology, uh, pushed an ideology that his system was better than psychology, psychiatry, and was pushing a a belief that the, the mind is like a battery. And if you've had trauma, you have people relive the trauma over and over and over again until you get don't have a charge anymore. And, but the goal in Scientology, aside from extracting money and making people dependent, is to exteriorize, to get out of your body, to develop these superpowers where you can read minds and move objects, except no one ever demonstrated they could. But the, the, the point I'm trying to say is that somebody can be in Scientology, whether they're born in it or recruited, get out of it, never get counseling, then go into the space, and they've got these ideas that they're carrying with them that the mind is like a battery, and the mind isn't like a battery, memory is not like a battery, you know, and, and they can take these ideologies from other places that have never been worked through in their own understanding that it's not uh, true at all and it's actually detrimental to have people relive trauma over and over and over again until they're numb to it that's not what any good trauma therapist would ever want uh, it's do no harm is, is our our credo but um uh, I think we need we need to to do more naming it, naming specific uh, ideologies, boundary violations, and and really educate consumers. And that's why I, I jumped at the at the opportunity to invite you to be on this podcast because I I really want former members, some of whom are doing ketamine, they're doing all kinds of exploratory psychedelic stuff and the belief it's going to cure their, their, their trauma of being in a cult or being raised in a cult. And I don't believe for a second that that's what's going to help them. Understanding the dynamics of social psychology, understanding hypnosis, meeting with former members who've been healed, um, you know, doing the, the psychoeducation and the rewiring of one's own brain, feeling in this state of consciousness, not tripping your mind out, but being, being in the real world, identifying triggers, neutralizing triggers. That's what I feel is the essence for former members to recover from mind control, not tripping their brains out. Right. I mean, I, I, I think that's a really persuasive point that, you know, no chemical is going to replace for psychoeducation. Um, and and you know, wanting a quick fix is understandable, but it's just not realistic. And not only is it not realistic, but due to the dynamics in this field and the sorts of people who are are attracted 
right. to working with vulnerable people with a sense of special healing ability that, um, you know, it, it just, it, it, it is a, it is an especially dangerous field. Like the people who are putting out a shingle right now and advertising their insurpassable healing powers are oftentimes precisely not the people that you want to be entrusting yourself to. Right. And that people with backgrounds in cults already are especially vulnerable to that right. kind of love bombing and, and honeymooning and, and promising that some of these charismatic leaders are are able to to tap into. Yep. Especially if you were born or raised in a cult where you were trained to be obedient to an authority figure, where it wasn't a lifelong developmental psychology process of you having ownership of your own mind, your own belief system, et cetera. There's a desire of that child part of us to find another authority figure, but a, a good one this time. And uh, so the, the desire for that <laughs> relief is so powerful. And if you're in a place where you're having anxiety attacks, panic attacks, sleep disorders, feeling like hurting yourself, you know, I should say eating disorders, a million other disorders, you want a quick fix, you know? And, uh, but danger, 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 because um, unless it's about teaching you how to have more agency and, and be centered within your own body, and having ethical people in your life who genuinely care about you that you can reality test with, um, uh, it, it really is a potential recipe for disaster. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, you know, I, I very much empathize with people who are, are really seeking out some kind of relief at the moment from all of the terrible things that are going on in the world, let alone people who have these backgrounds with, with these types of groups. But it is a, a very, um, you know, little red riding hood world out there right now with, mm. with the psychedelics field. Mm. Um, just a lot of, a lot of people are drawn to it who really are not people that you want to be entrusting your mind to. Right. And it's, it's not a, it's not a small thing to take a mind altering substance to go back to the basics that I learned decades ago, it's it's set and setting. You know, are you are you in a safe space with people you trust? You know, what's mm -hmm. your expectation? What are the stimuli, etc.? And you can still take too much, or you know, other things can happen that you hadn't planned for. And uh, the the trip sitter has just extraordinary amount of power. Yeah, and especially with the emphasis on integration, even after the fact, where people are, you know, they've just had oftentimes a very big emotional experience, and then the the guide, the therapist, is you know unpacking it with you, helping you process it and integrate it into your life story. But for someone who is there not for what's genuinely best for you, but because either they're in a group, they've been indoctrinated indoctrinated into a perspective where their worldview is the priority, or they're just, you know, not trained to be able to support people as individuals very well. There's a lot of opportunity in that those that after effect space where people at the afterglow period where people right. are potentially quite suggestible to you know, interpretations of their experience by others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I want to share another cult pattern, if I may, for people to be aware of. And that is when you're in an authoritarian relationship or cult, if you have a bad experience, it's always your fault. It's never the leader, the doctrine, or the policy, or in this case, the substance. It's you had bad karma. You didn't commit yourself completely. You had a, ba a bad past life that, <laughs> that interfered. I mean, there's always an excuse, but mm -hmm. what I, uh, why I'm saying this is because if, if anyone's listening to this now and has had a bad experience on psychedelics with somebody, 
um, or a group. Um, this is an area to really learn more about, to realize it's not you, that there's this, this bioethical frame that really needs to be examined. And I, as a therapist, I'd say, start writing down your experiences, just unpack them, go chronologically. And the memories may be a little scatter, but just do your best to to do it in a chronology and get a consult uh, on this. And uh, the article that I cited a minute ago was about an elderly person who had been a Holocaust survivor. There are elder abuse uh, organizations. The biggest one that I'm aware of is in California, elderjusticecal.org, where they have a framework for evaluating elder abuse. And, and, and of course, my bite model and, and Shefflin social influence model helps tremendously. But the point is, pay attention to your parents, you know, and it's not just young people who are doing psychedelics. There are a lot of elderly people who are suffering, and they too can be very susceptible. They lose their, their wife, their husband. They can be very, very vulnerable. Absolutely. And I'm I'm really glad you mentioned that point just before about the, you know, the ways that negative out- outcomes are often blamed on the individual, whereas positive outcomes are attributed to the healer or right. the group or the substance. That is happening in many of the most powerful organizations and 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 figures in the psychedelics field, even in some clinical trials where Hmm. All the benefits are attributed to the psychedelic. And then anything that happens just as, you know, that's, you know, an accident. That was something else in their life. Or um, commonly people are saying that, uh, you know, oh, that person was just borderline. They're manipulative. They're, you know, the the person who had a, a, a negative account. They just are trying to gain some power and control. But that that should be a red flag in and of itself, yeah. that that pattern is ongoing. And so for people who are trying to vet organizations or, or or guides or whatever else, that's something to look out for. If there's like excuses about why someone has had a hard time that's never about the organization or anything that could have happened in the setting of the, of the session, that right. should be, give people pause. Yep. And I'll, I'll, I'll cite um, my mentor who helped uh, with his model from 1961 uh, of, of eight criteria of brainwashing that he, from his study of Chinese communist brainwashing, Robert J. Lifton. He has eight criteria, and I based my bite model on his model and, and, and Leon Festinger and Singer and a few other people's, but he talks about the sacred science as one of the criteria of brainwashing. And in, in, in it, he says that it's the ultimate moral vision combined with the claim of science, so you can't question it. And in this part of brainwashing, it's the opposite of science. Science says we have a hypothesis. We test it. We, we we're committed to pursuing the truth, not having a doctrine that's elevated as if it is the only way to think about reality. And that's another piece that people can. Uh, I've I've interviewed Lifton. I have the eight criteria spelled out on my freedomofmind.com website. It's another way that people can start, especially the bioethicists that you're. Uh, working with, they they really should be looking at these criteria and going, hmm, what applies, what doesn't apply, and how can we move, you know, the frame and the discussion forward in a way that's going to really promote science and well-being for the biggest number of people. Yeah, I mean, because that's, that's a great point too, and it made me think about the just we, we started out our conversation talking about these grand visions for how psychedelics and AI are fitting into an evolutionary future. And part of the problem for the science in psychedelic studies is that there are some people that are funding it 
in some cases running trials or involved in trials, not not everyone, but enough people that this is an issue uh, who are just convinced at the outset that psychedelic medicine, I mean, in some cases, people think this it's no, there's no accident that psychedelics are arising right now, that we're going through this kind of birthing process as a species hmm. that is moving us as if through a birth canal into our next stage of being, and that psychedelics emerged just at this time to be able to help us navigate the changes that are happening. And so for people who have that pre-existing conviction that psychedelics are here to save the world, which is not a rare view uh, in the psychedelics ecosystem, there is a willingness to cut corners, accept harms mm -hmm. going on, put people in harm's way actively, because the mission of getting psychedelic medicine out to the world is seen as so important that it's okay to to make some some you know decisions along the way that otherwise might not be seen as ethical. Yeah, so I want to bring back, because this is my expertise, cults. Uh, there are more than a few cults that teach the false ideology that if you, for example, are raped as a child, your soul created that experience. So it, it, there's no such thing as a victim, and everything that happened, you were mugged, whatever, it's it it was meant to be mm -hmm. uh and you attracted it into your life even there's this law of so-called law of positive attraction which doesn't it's not a law and it doesn't work but it's a belief and an ideology but this this um this point that you just made uh reminds me of a point you made with dave troy in your interview and that was that uh uh, Hoffman came up with psychedelics and LSD in a post-nuclear bomb age. And I'll also say I just watched Oppenheimer, uh, the movie as well. And, um, and I'll just cite my mentor, Robert J. Lifton, one more time, because he, he believes, and his frame is psychohistorical, he believed that with the invention of the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, uh, it wiped out all of the normal ways for achieving what he called symbolic immortality. You know, that, that the bomb could wipe out our children, our creations of art. Uh, it could not just wipe out our country, it could wipe out everything that lives. And it, by, by this creation of the bomb, the only thing left of the different methods he called transcendence and so it opened the door of well we can just go to heaven or we can do lsd and evolve to a higher um, you know spiritual levels so it doesn't matter so much if the planet gets extinct mm -hmm. we can just evolve so there's a frame historical frame that now we're in a new new cycle of that it seems Absolutely. Yeah. And, and and that the earlier point you just made as well um, about how people are the uh, law of attraction, the, the idea that people are creating the circumstances, even bad circumstances in their life because they're curating what they need to evolve as as souls or however you want to frame it. Yeah. That idea is widespread in the psychedelic ecosystem. And what 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 happens is that anyone who speaks up about being raped, about being harmed in these groups that hold that idea, they're automatically disqualified yeah. as credible voices because they've shown that they're embracing a victim mentality. And so with, right. within the the logic of the cult groups that are working with psychedelics, that they use that to maintain the narrative because they can point and say, well, look, they're showing that they're not spiritually evolved enough to take responsibility. And so they're necessarily unreliable narrators here. Right. It, this is a fascinating discussion for me because I feel like we're I'm cross pollinating ideas. Uh, I'm learning from you so much. Um, but um, uh, what was the point I wanted to make next about that? That um, 
I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> um, uh, we'll come back to it or we'll do it on another, another conversation. But there's so many cultic um, groups that I've worked with over 47 years, and some of these ideologies uh, are, 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 are coming back to me. Um, what else do, do we want to cover on this? It's just, so we live in a very, very, um, high anxiety reality right now. And people are not, you know, our minds were not evolved. Oh, I just remembered the point ev mm -hmm. evolution. That's where we started with this and what is the future. Um, so another toxic ideology is this Darwinist idea that, um, you know, that, that it, it's okay to ignore the past, like the indigenous seven generations, every decision is influenced by our ancestors and seven generations to come. So they're very ground focused as well as community oriented the, this 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 notion of well we have billions so we're superior to everybody else so we get to choose you know the future evolution and mm -hmm. everyone else is inferior or the people who are in the cult at the higher levels they're more evolved because they're higher up in the cult mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the, really dangerous yeah, and and increasingly, like the billionaires with all of these ideas and their uses of psychedelics and AI, they're they're even some of them like Christian Angermeyer is theorizing like the development of psychedelics as a means of managing those on the lower sides of the hierarchy who aren't equipped to be making these decisions of where humanity is going and who might rebel against the disappearance of jobs and the destruction of ecosystems. And so like they're, because they're not, they don't have that vision of where we're headed because they're not developed enough. They're, there's thinking through the use of psychedelics to actually repress, you know, and prevent the future for, pre prevent the possibility of, of people rising up and, and, and rejecting this transhumanist vision for the future so important so the 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 notion that these devices can be used for mind controlling people into dependent obedient uh minds i come back to mk ultra and the manchurian candidate where they were using lsd and and and, and other techniques to try to make people assassins uh, do things against their will, against their better in interest, against their own values and their own conscience. I think conscience is a really important uh, part of our beingness and how the human species has actually evolved and thrived because we need each other. We are social beings. We need a community. We need to lift each other up. Nobody's, you know, level and great all the time. Everybody goes through ups and downs and life cycle events, losing loved ones, uh, illness, etc. We need each other. We can lift each other up. And so, you know, as we're beginning to wrap up and I'll give you the last word, I just feel like um, in this moment in time, we, we really need to remember relationships in the real world matter real friendships, real hugs, not emojis, like real people uh, and, 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 and sleeping and exercising and eating good food is all so vital to being able to think critically and also to think about, we want planetary survival. We don't want to erase the planet. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. This is our home. This is where we live. This is where our kids are. This is where our grandkids are and our nephews and nieces. So that's my last talk and your last words as we begin to wrap up this fascinating yeah. conversation. Well, just, just as a final kind of cautionary perspective on how some of the psychedelic industry is being developed, 
there is um, like just recently I saw there's an announcement about a new trial that's going to happen for lower back pain. And that is an example that is so tied to systemic issues in terms of like unwalkable cities and people not having enough time to move around and mobilize. And yet psychedelics are being pitched as, you know, oh, we'll just address the lower back pain. And there's a real risk. My, my colleagues at Symposia, or some organization, research organization that's been kind of exploring some of the themes that I discussed today, um, we've drawn the connection to, um, you know, factory farming, where mm. factory farming conditions would otherwise be intolerable. Like the animals would die because of bacteria and all the rest. Mm. But if you add antibiotics, it allows for a system that really shouldn't exist in the form that it's being done to mm -hmm. continue on. And there is a real risk that the way that psychedelics are being rolled out might be used to paper over and reinforce a system that is inherently harmful and, and, and working against people's ability to move and stay hydrated with clean water and have access to clean food and have the things that they would otherwise, that would otherwise support flourishing. And so right. just urging people to remember that, that there are some people that are really trying to keep the world broken and harmful and that psychedelics are being seen as one, one po possible application towards that. Um, yeah. It's not all just positive and working in everyone's best interest. Yeah, the libertarian stuff. We don't want government regulations. We want to make as much money as we can. We want to keep you, you know, selling and and keeping people dependent on fossil fuels. And I'm remembering and we're wrapping up, but Dave Troy talked about how we're being, you know, given all this advertising to eat 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 and now we have an obesity problem. And so when you were just mentioning farming chickens or, or, or pigs and other livestock and how uh, this factory farming to make money, mm -hmm. to make money, even if it's harming people, Definitely. it's to make money. And it's like, why? It, why is money more important than people's well-being? And yeah. in the end, when people die... They're on their deathbed. They're not saying, I wish I made more money. They're often reflecting, going, what good did I do? I wish I had spent more time with my family and friends. So we need to Absolutely. come back to values, human values. Niche, thank you so much for your incredibly important work. The organization is some... Uh, P Symposia with the P. Yeah, P-S-Y-M-P-O-S-I-A. So... Those my colleagues there uh, have really kind of uh, developed and advanced this critical side um, of say where if there's anyone you know who has insights about some of the the groups that have been causing harm or anything feel free to reach out. We have a, a tips at symposia.com email. Um, feel free to connect and, and just say I wanted to just end myself by saying thank you so much for talking. It, it has been um, these concerns have long been a part of my focus with psychedelic studies, but a lot of the people in the field that I work in are not open to this side of the conversation. So mm. I've really, it's, 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 it's been a, a dream really to connect with other people um, in other fields who, who have this sort of analysis on the situation. So thank uh, you. It's my honor. It's my pleasure. And we're going to do a blog and put the video of our interview and we'll add links to important articles that uh, uh, about other uh, key figures and things that everyone should know about. So thank you so much. And thank you. Steve Hassan here. You know, it's been decades since my family rescued me from the Moonies. I've been at this for over 47 years. The need has never been greater. If you're able, please consider hitting the super thanks button below and it'll help us to do better. Every penny will help us toward our goal of educating the planet about undue influence. Remember, it's your mind, only you should control it. <laughs>